Dr. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start off by asking you to explain to our viewers and our listeners uh, how mangroves differ from other trees and what their importance is when it comes to protecting the tropic oceanic systems. Mangroves are, I would say, basically they are trees and shrubs that grow in saline waters along the coastline. So they are referred to as coastal forests, I will call them, in simple terms. Because then if you go into the sands, to be more, more, more of definition, and they're quite important for coastal protection. And they're also important for fish, as fish breeding areas. So we have fish that are specifically breeding in the mangroves. Um, they're also important since they sequester carbon, they sink carbon that we it's released from the environment. So this helps us mitigate or reduce the impacts of climate change. And they are quite specific because they only grow along coastline in, in saline waters. Mm. So they grow within the intertidal, the low and high tide regions. What are some of the threats that they face? Uh, several threats. Mangroves facing is very important to note that some of these threats are also country dependent, depending on how each community is using their, their mangroves and depending on the level of protection each country is giving. But some of the main threats are, for example, conversion of mangrove swamps for shrimp farming, very common in uh, Asian countries, um, use of mangroves as timber for construction, building and construction by coastal communities, um, um, pollution uh, uh, from different sources, uh, some of the main threats facing mangroves. And where can we find these mangroves in Africa? Uh, what are some of the places around the continent where we can find them? And why should somebody who lives inland, who doesn't live on these coastal areas, care about them? Uh, some of the places where we find mangrove, uh, for example, uh, I would say along the Kenyan coast or along uh, what we refer to as the Western Western Indian Ocean areas. That's where I'm very conversant with, the coast of Seychelles, Mozambique. Uh, also in West Africa, they're found there. Uh, but I'm quite conversant with those that are found along the, the, the coastlines of the Western Indian Ocean and mainly in Kenya. Mm. And in the recent times, I've also visited Brazil. So I got to see the Amazon mangroves in, in Kurusa region of Para. Yeah. And again, I guess the second part of that question was that why is it that somebody, why would somebody that doesn't live uh, on the coastline care about the health of the mangroves? Like I mentioned to you initially when we began that mangroves are very important because they sequester carbon. But also when you cut mangroves, they then, because their carbon sinks, then they will release this carbon back into the environment because of the peat soil that they have on the, on the, on the places where they grow. They have a thick um, soil where they grow, which is like mud. So if you cut them, then they emit this. Uh, cut the mangroves, they'll emit this uh, carbon. But also if you leave them in touch, then they'll sequester. They'll take in the carbon. Mm. So that's why it's very important that we conserve we conserve mangroves and also, of course, replant them in places where they've been degraded. Now you've traveled to places outside of Kenya to study these mangroves. Do you find that the communities around these areas understand the importance of the mangroves? And what do you tell them about their role in protecting and uh, restoring the mangroves? Yeah, thanks for that interesting question. Communities are quite important when we talk about conservation, and that's why it's very important that we look at conservation from an integrative approach, where we don't leave the community members behind. Uh, reason being that they, they, are, they are the ones who are directly impacted if we lose mangroves, they will they will lose the benefits that they get from mangroves. For example, if we clear all the mangroves, like I mentioned, they're important for coastal protection from, for example, storms like tsunamis uh, when they come. So if you don't tell them that this system is important 
for this role of the coastal protection. And then they we end up losing all the mangroves. Then the consequences will be faced by the community members. This is why they play a very important role. And also culturally, some communities must just get fish <laughs> from the uh, from the waters. So this is again, if we lose this system, then it means they will not get this fish, which may be for which may be very important for their subsistence use. Right. And also just for for, for food, and maybe they also sell them and get some money for their income. So it's a, it's a very important uh, need for us to to be able to include communities when we talk about conservation of mangroves, because they're the, the the first I would say the primary dependent of the mangrove ecosystem is the communities around them. Talk to us about your work in Brazil around mangroves. What were some of your findings on the relationship between the communities, say in Brazil? and the communities in Kenya, the coastal communities in Kenya, in how they relate to the mangroves? My my work in Brazil was quite interesting. And uh, of course, it was a collaborative research. And some of the main uh, findings in having worked or carried out the same research in Kenya using the same tools and then now applying the same tools of research in Brazil, we found, we found that uh, the communities in Brazil uh you the sort of the approach and use of the mangroves was a bit different from the Kenyan context and also the pressure they put on their mangrove systems for for example it it in this particular region where we were it came out very clearly that this community are very dependent on mangrove for fisheries heavily dependent such that i think in every meal they were having those fish on the table so that that for me was quite quite uh, impactful uh, and show, it shows that if these systems are lost, then these people really, where will they get their, their livelihood? And like in Kenya, there were other sources of income for local community members are not solely reliant on uh, on fisheries. For example, they will, uh, they will harvest honey for use. In both situations, it was very clear that the communities Really need the mangroves for their for their survival. For example, in one in one instance, there's a lady who told us if she doesn't go to the mangroves in a day to collect crabs, then she has no food. So basically, she has to be in the mangroves every day collecting crabs. Mm. This is something I didn't experience in the Kenyan case, and also in the mangroves in Brazil, the 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 pressure on uh, cutting for like fuel wood is not so much like in the Kenyan context. So it was it was quite interesting to see how, for them, uh, the people in Brazil they believe in the cultural they have a cultural event they they take that takes place within the mangroves where they go and play in the mud. It's kind of a, I, was, I think it's kind of spiritual <laughs> that people go and have like a carnival in, in the in the in the mangroves in Kenya. I didn't I didn't see this. Yeah. So it, the the difference was coming out clearly more on the. How the different communities use uh, the mangrove for for different benefits. Yeah. So I guess and in Brazil there's more of an understanding about the role of the mangroves in the sustenance of the community, in that they provide the fish and other types of seafood for them to, you know, for their for their food. I wouldn't say that they, in Brazil there's much of understanding. I think the level of understanding of the different community groups on the importance of mangroves was visible. It's just that how the different communities in Kenya and in Brazil were using their, their mangroves uh, is what was coming out as a bit different. You see, like in, in Brazil, like I've mentioned, it was the cultural uh, use was very strong. In Kenya, what I would call provisioning services like fish, timber were coming out very strong, you see, uh, use of mangroves for medicine. So it was about resource use that was quite clear. But in terms of appreciation of importance and why mangroves should be there and should be protected, both communities were, were quite conversant with this. You have an initiative in Kenya uh, that I read about uh, where you're helping communities plant trees. Can you talk to us about that? This is taking place in Akara Hills, which is part of a very important ecosystem connection between Akara Hills, uh, Lake Kanyaboli, which, which is an Oxbow Lake, and the Ala Swamp, 
So I always call this like a pet project <laughs> because I started it off immediately just after my undergraduate studies transiting into my master's or level of study. And uh, the reason being that I grew up in this area that we are currently working on planting trees. And I realized that there's a lot of environment degradation. And I wondered what is it that I can do based on the knowledge that I've acquired in school to help my, my community work towards conservation of these very important ecosystems. Uh, so that's how we started the project on uh, tree planting. So basically writing proposals for fundraising, uh, carrying out uh, community education with school going children in in primary and secondary schools in Kenya, and then also reaching out to community groups, women groups. Uh, we have groups of women coming together to lift themselves economically. So we'll I'll go in and we have a talk and then we'll have people being trained on how to uh, raise trees in nurseries. So it's, it's an initiative that has come a long way, I must say. What can yeah. you say you've been able to achieve so far with this project? One of the biggest milestones is the change in attitude and, and behavior and just the willingness of the community to come out strongly for the need to conserve the different ecosystems. Uh, when we went in, the community were willing, but there's a bit of uh, uh, doubt and a bit of mm -hmm. resistance and Every time you talk about conservation of natural resources, people think you want to grab them away from them because they relate that a lot <laughs> to certain incidences they faced. So when we started, it was a bit of a, of a struggle. But looking back, it's almost 10 years since we started. And I'm very, very happy to say that there, there's a lot of change in attitude. You can see community members coming out and saying, uh, we've seen uh, an investor coming in. We are concerned this is going to destroy, for example, the wetland. If we, for example, drain it up for for income generating activities like growing rice and big agro industrial companies coming to to grow sugar cane. So you find that the community are now more vocal and ready to speak for the conservation of these particular areas. That has been my biggest uh, encouragement. And also just reaching out to me and asking, uh, in Kenya we call people with PhDs doctorate, so they will call you doctorate, how, how, how do we handle this issue? Is there any advice you can give us? Then we'll sit down together and see what kind of uh, approaches we can take or craft together to, to work towards the conservation of these right. systems. We are not yet there yet, <laughs> but we hopefully we will. The get. work continues. The work, Dr. The work Dr. Thank continues. you so much for taking time. We're running out of time, but thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today.